Hi, um, let me uh, just briefly give an overview um, about the talk. So uh, I'm gonna briefly set the stage um, for what we're talking about because it's a little bit different, but it's also very similar. Um, um, Melissa actually gave, gave a great setup for a lot of the concepts we're talking about. And then I'm gonna talk, uh, tell, uh, 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 take you through uh, some of the code. So uh, just first off, um, again, we're not talking about disease or gene phenotypes, but about the uh, vast space of natural phenotype diversity, um, which is enormously important um, for elucidating uh, evolutionary relationships uh, and the evolutionary processes that have given rise to uh, biodiversity. And uh, the vast majority of these natural uh, phenotypes uh, are uh, documented in meticulous detail, but in natural language. And um, as probably many here can appreciate, the natural language uh, phenotype descriptions or trait descriptions, as we would more likely say uh, for natural phenotypes, um, are highly resistant to uh, computing. And so um, it's, uh, another problem is that all these evolutionary uh, models or, or, or uh, algorithms and applications that I was talking about um, treat morphologies uh, as if individual uh, traits were completely independent from each other. And we know very well that that's uh, not the case, right? Uh, the elements in an anatomy in an organism are far from independent on each other and related to each other in all kinds of ways. Um, so uh, the Phenoscape project um, 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 tackles some of these challenges. It started back in 2007 with a mission to make morphology computable, discoverable, uh, and linked to genetic data. I'm not going to talk today about genetic data at all, but really um, since uh, the last few years, we've um, focused most of this work, and this tool that I'm presenting is uh, so far chiefly uh, aimed towards addressing the morphology side and uh, making access and adoption of the morphology data uh, uh, more, more easier. So just very briefly, how do we achieve this? Um, we take evolutionary phenotype data and model organism data and subject them through manual creation to the same uh, standardization process using ontologies. Um, this is a lot what um, Melissa already talked about, so I'm not gonna spend much time uh, here. Uh, the Phenoscape knowledge base that's in the center here um, essentially uh, follows the following architecture. Again, ignore the left-hand sub at the model organisms. I'm not gonna talk about that. And the important part here really um, to remember maybe it's just that there's an awful lot going on uh, under the hood. That's the box in the uh, below. Um, and, um, and I'm really gonna focus um, the rest of this talk on this little uh, square there in the upper right-hand corner, which is the uh, R um, tool that um, connects to the Phenoscape KB web API. So um, that's called our Phenoscape. Our Phenoscape is an R package for API access to the Phenoscape knowledge base um, and uh, particularly provides convenient access to the following things. Number one, uh, convenient access to the evolutionary character data with computable semantics, i.e. all the ontology links. And it also provides uh, access to the machine reasoning uh, capabilities um, that the uh, uh, Phenoscape KB uh, either provides itself or actually enables to the data that it has. Uh, specifically, these are semantics-based data filtering, um, trait dependency, uh, evidence-based mutual exclusivity of traits, and synthetic supermatrix synthesis, and semantic similarity matrix. Um, I won't really talk, um, I, I won't really talk, take you through much code that um, is about the first. Um, that's existed for a longer time, that's it's not really very new. Uh, and so I'll focus on the, on the remaining four. And so you might ask why in our package um, that may not be the most popular uh, ecosystem for a lot of people working in genomics. However, it's uh, widely popular uh, and a very rich ecosystem for people working in phylogenetics and comparative methods. And that's really our target audience here. Um, so getting started for an R package, this follows the usual step, except for now you have to install this from GitHub and not from CRAN, the comprehensive R archive network. And then you can get uh, an overview, for example, about the data that's in there. And let me just clarify a little bit of the terminology here, uh, because again, it's maybe a little bit um, unfamiliar for people in the, in the genomics area. Um, 
um, again, trade data here, trade of phenotypes. I'm going to use the two terms pretty much interchangeably. Our observable characteristics of an organism so that are the product of its genome and development and interacting with its environment, right? So this is probably uh, not too unfamiliar. Character, and, and so I alluded to earlier, right, um, for natural phenotype data, these data are typically published as character state matrices, and in such matrices, characters are the columns, taxa are the rows, and curators link the states, um, which are essentially the, sta the, the cells to one or more ontology-defined phenotypes, okay? And so um, let's go into some code here. Um, so starting uh, character states, as I just said, right, they're linked to ontologically defined phenotypes. Um, and so here I uh, start with obtaining a study and then I uh, can get uh, uh, phenotypes from the knowledge base uh, using the semantics-based filtering, right? So there are no um, phenotypes uh, directly uh, annotated in natural text to serotobranchial five tooth, right, uh, comma shape or something, right, that gets translated into uh, ontology terms and then, uh, in and then uses the index of the ontology terms to pull out the respective phenotypes. So that returns a data frame, which is one of the most common data structures in R, and we can look at some of the labels here that are human readable, right? I'm not showing the IRAs, they're not uh, really human intelligible, but more importantly here, what I wanna get to is that uh, any, every one of these phenotypes, right? Here I'm showing just one, I can turn into an object and that um, has all the links to ontology terms, right? So here's the character state that it's linked to, it's the bicuspid state, uh, the state labeled bicuspid for the character serotobranchial five tooth shape right, from the study, and this is linked to the NED uh, term from Uberon and the quality term from Pado that um, um, formalize uh, the semantics of the phenotype. So uh, just to keep in mind, the uh, links between character states and phenotypes is an end-to-end -end relationship, really, and uh, we can show, and this is one of the key features, right, about making the character state data interoperable across all the data matrices rather being side, than being siloed in one data matrix, right? So we can, for example, for this one, pull together all the states um, and then um, can observe that there's uh, uh, now other studies here being pulled in as well, rather than the one I started with, right? That's one of the two ends that I was referring to. And also that one of the states here um, has links to uh, two um, um, phenotypes, right? Because it's really uh, combines in its uh, description, in its natural language description, two actual um, qualities. And so um, these terms uh, that define the phenotypes link to computable domain knowledge, and uh, we can then leverage this uh, domain knowledge formalized in anatomy ontologies um, to uh, 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 using these relationships, right? And just sort of an example here quickly, um, if I use the, um, I have access through the Arphenoscape package, right, to all these relationships here, for example, for the term femur, um, what it is a part of, what it develops from, what it is a subclass of, and so on and so forth. And I can then use our knowledge of ontology, uh, of anatomy formalized in the Uberon ontology to make inferences about um, dependence, right? In this case, presence absence dependency. So I can here obtain a matrix that um, tells me if the presence of one NED uh, or anatomic element implies the presence of another, right? So we can, for example, see that the presence of the femur implies the presence of the hind limb butt, right? Because the femur develops from a type of hind limb butt, right? And also implies the presence of a long bone, right? Um, presence, um, uh, uh, the matrix here is not symmetric. Um, um, and, and so I'll, I think I'm gonna need to uh, move on for in the interest of time. Um, and so um, to carry on, this dependency can then also be used to infer traits uh, based on presence-absence dependency, right? 
And so there's a number of things that, uh, there's not only the presence absence dependencies uh, that allows us to infer, uh, but also all semantics, right? So in the phenotype expression, for example, the all semantics, if I have a quality and in here since some entity, right, all semantics tell us that there is actually some instance of the entity exists, right? So I can infer the presence. And so we've taken this to uh, a large scale analysis and just to uh, illustrate this a little bit here, I have access uh, to this within the Arfinoscape API, right? It's called OntoTrace, I can obtain OntoTrace uh, data or this inference presence, uh, presence absence trait matrices uh, for a taxon and say here, for example, for dorsal fin across all the telios, right? And uh, that returns um, a t uh, almost 3,400 taxa, uh, whereas originally uh, annotated presence absence for dorsal fin only covered 370, right? So it almost increased my uh, coverage of taxa uh, by a factor of 10, right? And so uh, just uh, sort of as an aside, most of these inferences are not missing values, right? Most of these inferences are actual presence or absences. Um, I can also use uh, the data instead of the actual anatomical knowledge to um, infer or, or to obtain evidence for whether uh, to uh, phenotypes are mutually exclusive with each other, right? So, so there's some uh, intuition that um, uh, an organism, there, there's not, that an organism can uh, simultaneously exhibit any pair of uh, phenotypes, right? And so we can use the data to actually look at this. And so for an example, right, if I collect a number of phenotypes here about uh, the serratobranchial five tooth, I can then um, obtain a data structure that collects uh, evidence from strong compatibility or strong evidence for compatibility to all the way to strong uh, evidence for exclusivity. And, um, and so if we look at some of these, right, then we see that the absence of the uh, tooth is um, exclusive with um, a number of other um, um, uh, attributes um, or qualities of it, right? So that will be expected. Uh, but there are also some surprises in the data that can then be used to uh, maybe uh, uh, look at um, curation errors, right? And so what I finally want to get to is that ontologies, uh, as we've heard uh, earlier from this, also enable um, computational uh, metrics of semantic similarity, right? And so um, um, just for example here, uh, how this uh, is accessible uh, computationally within the Arfinoscape package, if we just look at a number of anatomy terms that will probably make a sense to most people here for illustration, using pectoral fin, pelvic fin, and forelimb and hind limb, and then dorsal fin and caudal fin, right? Um, here, here's how I can easily compute this, and then I can, uh, instead of staring at the matrix, or I can also visualize this as a cluster dendrogram, uh, noticing here that the uh, dorsal fin and the caudal fin, which are unpaired fins, seem to be semantically more different from um, the other terms here. And so I can, um, let me see. Uh, uh, so, so how does this work under the hood? It actually uses a very computationally efficient data structure that's, uh, uh, that we call a subsuma matrix um, that essentially uh, creates a, a, a node embedding, if you will, um, using the subsumers for a given set of terms that you want to um, compute the semantic similarity um, across. And so um, how does this look? Just as an example, right? So the, this is just a long list of subsumers uh, you have as, as the rows. And then there's a one if the, um, if the row term um, subsumes the column term and zero otherwise, right? Um, and and so, so why is this useful? It provides a really efficient matrix. It allows really efficient matrix algebra to compare, uh, to compute a whole number of semantic similarity matrix very quickly uh, and without much effort uh, using the facilities built into R already. And so um, we can also use this um, to uh, compute profile similarity, right? Profile similarity is similar, semantic similarity between groups rather than pairwise uh, between single um, 
uh, terms or nodes, right? And so, for example, in, here in R, we do this creating a factor. And so if we, for example, um, bin the, all the fins into one uh, group and all the limbs into one group, and then also bin the pelvic fin, pectoral fin for them and hind limb into the paired appendage group and the other two into the um, unpaired, we can create an intersection uh, and compute the profile similarity and uh, find that um, a paired fin, for example, are more similar to paired limbs than they are to the unpaired fins, right? Because they're homologous with, either, with each other and the uh, semantic similarity actually bears it out. And so um, there's uh, some other methods here in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over this, uh, um, but there are various ways to, uh, for profile similarity to uh, reduce the, pairwise scores into a single score, right? They, uh, they're all implemented uh, here. And so what I wanna get to here is that semantic similarity is also, also computable for phenotype class expressions, right? They showed this just for illustrations for uh, straight up anatomy ontology terms. And so uh, we can, for example, do this for all the phenotypes uh, of the basically high L bone across the entire um, phenoscype knowledge base and see that um, we have, we end up with different clusters. For example, you see here the shapes, here the sizes and lengths, and then here uh, is some uh, basically high, uh, some surfaces, right? So you can really um, visualize the similarities um, between the different phenotypes being more closely or being more distantly related. Uh, we can then also use the phenotype semantic similarity to uh, uh, compute a, uh, something like a semantic information content across characters or even across studies and compare them from a semantic standpoint, right? So here I'm doing this for studies, right? All the studies that um, have phenotypes about the basic hyal bone and I've used just those to compare semantic similarity profiles for each study you know, some studies align uh, with each other much more closely than others. And so, so that was a walkthrough through the major um, parts, major computational capabilities of the our Phenoscape package. And I wanna just uh, sort of uh, at the tail end of my talk, um, go through a few thoughts as to how it ended up relatively successfully, as relatively successful as it did. So number one is we started, um, with driving use cases uh, uh, extracted from um, uh, full uh, 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 a phrase, uh, um, user stories that describe the personas, why they wanna do something, how they wanna do something, you know, that gives context. So that was um, very helpful uh, and uh, at hindsight. Um, also, a strong focus on usability. Um, so that requires understanding your audience, which is why user stories are really important to start with. Um, and, uh, you know, that entails, uh, once you understand your user audience, right, is uh, how is the computational environment, the ecosystem that they normally work on, and make it as easy as possible for them, as seamless and barrierless and frictionless, I guess, is what I'm, what I'm, the term I'm reaching for, as possible for them, right? Um, one thing here that I really want to mention that um, uh, it gets often underestimated is uh, what proved to be very powerful is, a, is an efficient and highly parameters term finder, uh, right? It sounds very trivial and like really a, a sort of plumbing that um, found very important. And so that extends to, you know, more uh, complicated uh, things like, pr for example, class expressions where you can input a natural language description uh, and then obtain it um, fully turned into IRIs. So some control over the database API um, also proved useful. And I think about a, I'm, I'm about at the end of, the, of, the, of my time here. And, and finally, actually users as part of the project, right? Um, really important um, rather than trying to develop for people, for, for hypothetical users. Um, uh, current limitations just briefly, it's not yet on CRAN, um, so you need to install from GitHub. Uh, the Phenoscape data, uh, the Phenoscape KB content is concentrated vertebrates, and uh, FinLim characters mostly have some others too, but that's where most of the data is. And the uh, matrix synthesis is currently limited to presence absence. 
Uh, yeah, so in summary, our phenoscape is the bridge between computational morphology data and computational and the, uh, and the semantics capabilities of the phenoscape KB and the whole ecosystem of comparative phylogenetics uh, people, developers, researchers uh, working in R. It translates between R, right, and the KB API, which maybe sounds trivial, but in reality, when you try it yourself, it's actually far from it. And um, yeah, um, it's sort of an enabling tool for research approaches, right? Um, so with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge the funding from NSF uh, of the early stages of the, uh, uh, the whole Phenoscape project was incubated and for many years um, hosted at the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center, which does no longer exist. And, um, and finally to other Phenoscape contributors. Thank you.